Um, it's, this presentation is called The Master Photographers, a survey of fine art photography. And the reason why I call it that is not because it's complete, nor because it's ex especially exhaustive. Um, it might be exhaustive for, for the means of tonight, but as far, that's as far as we can go. Um, and indeed, a lot of you may disagree with who I have decided to profile. So essentially, it's a profile of 21 different photographers with just a couple pics of each person's great work. Um, and it's especially focusing on late 19th, 20th century photographers. This is a period when photography really becomes an art, integrates with the art establishment, and specifically the pictorialist and modernist movements. And so we've, I've squished out some of the earliest and squished out some of the latest photographers, but I want you to imagine that you're in a museum for now, but that somehow uh, we're in the greatest, single greatest photography museum in the world, right? George Eastman Museum in Rochester, New York, by the way, that's the one. But let's not say I said that. Rather, we're just in the best in the world, and somehow all the greatest photographers are here. And so we've just entered the museum in this great exhibit of all the great photographers, and we see the sort of beginning of the exhibit outlining it. And, and so essentially, I'm here to not give you a complete survey. This isn't a complete, uh, all the great photographers period, but it's a story. It's a narrative. It's a narrative of America's role in photography. It's a, the role of photography becoming its own. And it's a role of the development of photography. So, for instance, a lot of people would tell me that my choice of featuring Alfred Stieglitz and not Eugene Age is awful and I should die for that or something. Of course, I don't say that Age is, is worse than Stieglitz. And I didn't feature Robert Mapplethorpe. There's no particular reason for that. And I think those are, in many ways, Mapplethorpe is better than all of his contemporaries. But this is at most going to be two hours long. So I've chosen a more narrative approach. I've chosen the contemporaries of Mapplethorpe, but not Mapplethorpe, just so I can tell the story better. But so this is a story. It may also become your inspiration. And it's also a way to understand photography more generally, just the way that photography developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and it, it, I want to also foster your individual knowledge. So this isn't a particular in-depth, it's just a quick look at just a few of the best works. And so then you can go and research on, on your own. So it's just 21 photographers and their best work. And so we begin, ironically, without a photograph. This picture on our right here, it's not a photograph, it's a print. And prints were before we had political cartoons or newspaper cartoons. We needed to use printing presses for everything. And so prints were basically etched into stones or engraved into uh, different mediums, metals. <clears throat> and they were basically a form of cartoon before cartoon. Like, however, this was a lot more well regarded than a cartoon. It was a fine art in its own. And the person who created this print was uh, Honoré Daumier, a French printmaker. He was considered the best of the best. He was the best of his generation and still remains an extremely important artist today. Um, so what's important about Daumier in this, in this print here is specifically the caption. The caption reads, Nadar, élevant la photographe à la haute de l'art. Translated to English, it means Nadar has elevated photography to an art. So this is someone who's deep in the artistic establishment, who's an important artist of his time, realizing that photography has become an art indeed with our first featured creator here. And uh, his name is Nadach, he is French, that's not his real name, but it's his pen name. So he was a man who had one of the earliest photograph, uh, photographic studios. He was famous for his portraits, and specifically in that last print he was in a hot air balloon because he created some of the first aerial photographs. But what's interesting is back then we didn't have aerial photographs in plane. He had to use hot air balloons. This was a mid 19th century. It's, it's crazy to think about before planes, we have aerial photographs, right? But um, he is not particularly well known for his aerial photographs. He's considered to have his best work as just regular studio portraits. But he was incredibly well known for his portraits. So much so that all the famous people had lined up to take, have their portrait taken in the Da studio. This is, uh, the photograph you see here to the right, that is a self-portrait of Nada. But it's important that he doesn't call it a selfie like we do today. It's, it's not that he's just turned the camera around. He calls it a self-portrait. 
And it is actually signed. It's a signed print. This is very important. He's equating it to a painting of Baroque or the antiquity. And this is specifically a piece of fine art that he's asserting this is fine art. This is something that I'm signing and going to sell for a premium. So what can we notice here? Why is this considered a great photograph? Why, why do we take a selfie now and it's just something you put up on Instagram and this is a powerful photograph? Well, for one, he's posing very self-consciously. This is not a normal hand placement, nor is this. He's making a very specific face. It's, it's one of deep contemplation, perhaps even anguish. But what's also important is that it's a dramatic face. He is standing at what's three quarters view. So he's not straightforward. He's not staring at the viewer, but his eyes are. In other words, his eyes are staring straight forward, but his body is shifted three quarters. Now, what's important in that is that it's a dramatic pose. It's a shift between two poses. And he's also has his fingers scrunched up. It's all dramatic, but he also understands the ability to use light in photographs, especially black and white photographs, to create even more drama. Photographers will refer to this style as, or Nadak style, as the Rembrandt style. Now, a more correct art history term would be chiaroscuro, just because it's older, it's Italian, and it applies to more genres, more mediums. But chiaroscuro just means that you're uh, it's, it's a technique in making the subject contrast uh, tonally with the background or, or with what's around the subject. And you can see this here. Uh, this is a portrait of Alexander Dumas, the author of The Count of Monte Cristo, among other works. And this is Violet le Duc. Um, he was one of the most important architects in Paris at the time. And so these are two of the most important members of society. So clearly, Nadal studio is in high demand. But what you see here is, look at how uh, Violet Le Duc's forehead is so much brighter than the background here. It makes him jut out. Even though he is in a more traditional three-quarters view, he simply doesn't really have much of an expression. He still has that drama. He still sticks out. That's chiaroscuro. And chiaroscuro is even more important because it wasn't really used prodigiously until the Renaissance and Baroque period, especially the Baroque. So it's directly tying his photographs, Nadal's photographs, to the Baroque. It's a very clear indication that Nadal wants to be known as an artist, and he is successful. In fact, in 1874, the first ever Impressionist exhibition, the first ex exhibition of the Impressionist artists, was held in Nadal's studio. But that was in France. And so I started in France with this general idea that, that photography there starts to be some rules, some techniques to taking photographs. But at the same time, in this era of the mid-19th century, we, we get a very interesting occurrence also in, in America. This is uh, the work of Matthew Brady. But this is obviously not Matthew Brady. This is Robert E. Lee. So Brady was also well known for his uh, portraits. But in his case, he would take his camera outside of the studio. Also, not take it outside the studio. Interesting enough, he took a studio with him. He had built basically a house on wheels, a gigantic uh, carriage that contained a dark room, contained his, his own little studio, and where he kept all his photographic equipment. And he needed to construct this amazing feat in the mid 19th century because he was photographing the civic, civic, civil war. So here we have the, a leader of the opposite side, Tecumseh Sherman. Um, and Sherman here is taken not in a studio, he's at leisure, as if it was in a studio. He's just resting. Um, it's a very naturalistic portrait. And that's something that Brady is really well known for. It's, it's extremely naturalistic. It's as if you just caught him at the moment, right? That, that he's just thinking about something and, and you're just catching up with him. But he's not in a studio. He doesn't have, Brady does not have at his expense all the equipment. At this time, cameras are bulky, it would take a long time to expose a photograph. So in a studio, you usually have at your expense lots of little uh, dinky rinks and little tables for people to sit on and stand on and et cetera. So they could be happy and at rest as a photograph is being exposed. In this case, he has nothing but this random tree. And yet he looks so naturalistic. That's just Nada uh, uh, Brady's expertise. That in the field, in the tent, he can still create beautiful photographs and furthermore, poetic ones. We see here one of the earliest examples of the rule of thirds. 
And that means that this, this two thirds over here is kept, uh, two thirds of the composition on the right here is kept mostly, not entirely, but mostly empty. And empty as in lacking the subject. And the subject is pushed here to the leftmost third. And this is, uh, these are two soldiers who have been wounded on the battlefield. They're resting uh, off the front lines. And we have a sense of poetry here. Although two thirds of the picture is empty, it's purposely been left empty, so then we have a sort of narrative contemplation here. Our eye is very quickly drawn, because these two thirds are empty, our eye is drawn very quickly to these soldiers, first to the one on top, then to the one on bottom. And we see the look on their faces, look of tiredness, they're browbeaten, they've been through so much. But then, slowly our eye begins to wander and gaze here to the ruins of the environment that someone's house might have been here, someone's farm. There's a story that begins to come up with in your head. So that's the Brady's, that, that's the Brady touch. That this early, 1865, he can generate a story with just a single image. That we can imagine that a battle took place here. Someone was, someone lived here for decades and their work is gone. Their lives are gone, ravaged by war. And then we see the people who have been more recently wounded physically, where their blood has been shed for their country. These are Union soldiers. And the poetry continues, really, especially with this picture on the, on the left here. Um, these are Confederate soldiers who have been captured. And they, they seem at rest. They definitely aren't going anywhere. They know that they're going to be stuck here for a long time. And in the background, we see that the picture is generally cut into thirds again with, with um, three people cutting the composition into three. But also in the background, we see that there's the expanse of mountains. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's actually a church and a town far in the background. We get the sense of home. This is such a powerful, profound, artful image that they're not just framed just on a random fence. They're in a fence in a beautiful environment, but they're in prison. They're going to stay here. This is not a fun experience for them. And yet there's home in the background. There's this longing here that's on their faces too. They're tired, just like the Union soldiers pictured in the last slide. And finally, with this photo, it's just, that's Matthew Brady himself. That's him in his studio. Unfortunately, uh, later in his life, he died a poor man that he had spent so much taking photographs in the Civil War, no one bought them after the Civil War. There just wasn't that much interest. And unfortunately, they were almost lost. But fortunately, you can buy books today that are hundreds of his photographs collected. Fast forward a little bit. So we have this use of, we understand now the rules of photography. But we don't really know what to use it for. Edward S. Curtis here. Um, this is a photograph of a Zuni girl. And the Zuni are a Native American group. Uh, they're Puebloan people, um, which just means that they live in the Southwest, basically. Uh, they're a group in the Southwest, and at this time, they were known for being the only Native American group that had lived in the same area, in the same surroundings, in the same villages, in many cases in the same houses for millennia. Uh, they had mostly been, at points, been successful in keeping the Spanish, the colonialists away. And in this case, we see that they're all, they were also world famous for their pottery. And so you see a woman of Zuni combined with a pot uh, from the Zuni people, their well-known art. This is an ethnographic photograph. This is an anthropological photograph. We begin to realize that photography can be used to document, not just create poetry, not just to just take pictures of people at rest, at leisure. But we also, as we investigate in the 19th century, as we're trying to investigate what is this camera for, we see that it can also be used to capture a people, to tell people a message. In other words, if you have some white Americans living in New York, in Chicago, they probably never seen Native Americans, especially those in Europe, there was a sense of exoticism. So Curtis's pictures were in very, very high demand. He was a best-selling, well, author, he, pictures of his photographs. He was best-selling because people were really interested in these Native Americans or 
they, they, at that time, you know, we didn't use such polite terms for them. But people were interested, and so they sought good photographs of Native Americans. And so when you had someone who traveled out there to see them and take photographs of them, they wanted them. And so suddenly we realized that photographs can communicate a message of a people. They can communicate a culture. And in this case, there's a very clear message being communicated in this photograph. To a white American, to a European, they look at this photograph, they've never seen Native Americans before, and they realize a very distinct message. Well, for one, let's look at the composition of this photograph. There's parts to this. There's a rhythm. Um, in the, the subject, of course, are these writers here. These are Navajo writers. Navajo are just another people in the Southwest. So the writing here, so we had this bottom section which is dedicated to the actual subject, but most of the photograph is not for the subject. There's a section for the sky, and there's a big section for this mountain here. It's not actually a mountain, it's actually Canyon de Shelley. You still visit it today, it's a national monument. But, so you have the canyon, you have the sky, and it's geometric in many ways. This, the canyon sort of forms a rectangle, and same thing for the sky, same thing for the riders. There's a poetry. So it's almost like your eye is bouncing off from section to section until you reach the writers. They're dominated by this mountain that's clearly hundreds of writers tall. And you realize that the Native Americans, the message that's communicated here is that the Native Americans are in tune with nature, that nature is a part of the Native American culture. So with a photograph, they would have been accompanied by words, but even without words, you still basically get the point of it. You get that these are supposed to be Native Americans, and, and it's trying to communicate that Native Americans are in tune with nature, that they're in some ways a, a part of nature. But there's a problem with Edward S. Cur Curtis photographs, which is that he had the anthropological viewpoint of the day, which is that Native Americans, however sympathetic you are with them, they're still savages. Even the most sympathetic Americans still desired not just photos of Native Americans, they wanted photos of what they thought were Native Americans. So in many cases, uh, Curtis would photograph famous Native Americans, like Geronimo here, and you know, these would become more popular. And in other cases, he'd photograph them in very sensationalized environments. Sometimes a Native American would use modern day equipment, modern day appliances, and he'd purposefully hide those. Sometimes he literally just edit them out of the print. And, and uh, he replaced their clothes, he dolled them up. And this has gained him a lot of controversy. However, we do need to remember that this is still the 19th, well, in this case, I suppose the early 20th century. But this is still very early, right? This is still very, very liberal for the time that he's living in. But nonetheless, it is something to understand that there is, in a way, whoops, a dishonesty in his photographs. But generally, I want to end on this photograph because even though there may be a lot of dishonesty, there's still poetry. There's still a power with Curtis photographs that few other photographers have. You see he, this photograph here, and just like the Canon de Shelley photograph, it hits you. It's very clear what the message is. It's very clear that, in this case, these are some Canadian Native Americans. I'm not sure exactly of which um, ethnicity, but it's very clear that they are happy the way they are. And in the 20th century, in, in such an early period, that's very poignant because certainly we weren't leaving them the way they are. Even though uh, Curtis may have been a little bit racist from looking today, the message overall here is that is, is very, very liberal. And it's clearly very poetic and powerful. And to speak about trying to improve the lot of a people it's not just Native Americans who are trying to improve a lot of with photographs. It's also, well, white Americans themselves. So this is a photograph by Lewis Hine from 1920. It's probably his most important photograph, and it's one of the most notable photographs of all photography history. This is, uh, Lewis Hine was a liberal reformer. He did not believe in uh, child labor. He did not believe in the 12-hour work, uh, work day. So he was fighting for eight hour workdays and ending child labor, which this was a period when we had 12 hour workdays and child labor. And so he wanted to try to improve working conditions for people. And 
he decided to use photographs. You know, people like Edward that Edward S. Curtis, he can inspire change, he can inspire this, these ideas in people by using photographs. Now we have a likewise inspiration here that clearly this is a man who's working very, very hard. Justice alone, you might say, well, isn't Kurt, is it, or isn't Hein celebrating, uh, ingenuity? Isn't he celebrating hard work? This is a celebration. Well, when you look at the other photographs here, he immediately follows up with photographs like this of children looking at the viewer. Th th this child here, especially, I think, very pointed because he's staring straight at you and he's got this soot on his lower cheek here and they're just in this awful environment. It, it's dark. You can see that the light, there's strong light here, but it recedes very quickly in the darkness. It gives you a message to clear that these people shouldn't belong here. And, or don't belong here, I should say. And so clearly, it's not a celebration of hard work. It's hard work in the context of something being wrong here. It's too much hard work. That the industrialism that we saw in the first photograph is taking advantage of people. Here, is what many, many thousands of young girls were subjected to in the early 20th century. Um, young girls having to work in uh, sewing factories. And this was the case in America that when America became this industrialist power, that America was one of the most industrialized nations in the world, it, this industrial powerhouse, uh, many, many, many of the sewing companies of making garments required young girls because their fingers were small and nimble, which is a very sadistic thing to say, but it was true. And so you had people like this. Um, the focus is soft. There's a very small f-stop, and we're focusing on the, uh, the subject here of the girl. And even though this is the background is out of focus, a viewer would have known that this is a garment factory very, very easily. They would have seen this, they would have seen how dirty and unkempt she is, and they would have understood. And I want to end on this photograph because I think it's especially poignant that baseball, especially at this time, was such a big part of American culture. So Lewis Hine decides to photograph baseball. Everyone knows baseball, especially in this period, you know, it's Babe Ruth's time. I think this might have been even before Babe Ruth. But in any case, baseball is huge, and so, you know, sand lots are all across Chicago and New York. But here we're seeing a sandlot of a whole different type. We're seeing a sandlot of kids who are, do not look that happy. So to someone of this time, imagine this like being football practice, except it's in, you know, a ditch, right? It's the same point in image of why are we subjecting children to this? And Hein was successful. Hein is actually cited by people like uh, many, many politicians of the time as one of the key factors why child labor was stopped because his photographs were wildly popular. But these photographs, they're still documenting something. These photographs are still serving some purpose in the end. They're serving a purpose to something that is not part of the human condition on a deeper level, right? So like Hein, he's documenting child labor, but, but there's a political reason for that. Curtis, he's mainly an anthropologist he is using photography tricks, you know, and, and, uh, same thing goes for Nadak and Brady. Uh, they might be having this attachment, but there's, for Nadak, there's a social element. For Brady, there's an element of war that, because he's saying the government will purchase his photographs, he's taking pictures of war to document it for the government. F. Holland Day was one of the earliest people who, dis who said, this is preposterous. This isn't real art. You still haven't created real art here. Art needs to appeal far, far deeper. It needs to appeal to just the human consciousness. And it needs to be something that's timeless. And this is very, very important here. He started what the first true art movement in photography called pictorialism. This is really the first art move, true fine art movement because a photograph like this isn't really tied to labor reform. It isn't tied to changing the environment. It's tied simply to, well, for one, the title is youth. It's tied to something that we have all experienced. It's tied to something that is known to everyone. This is clearly depicting a nude young man. There's a reference to Greek antiquity here. It's, he seems sculptural. 
It seems like a Greek sculpture. And that's important. It's referencing, so like Nadakh, it's referencing art, but it's referencing it in a way that appeals to, it's not referencing it in service of anything. It's not referencing it simply because he can and he's just photographing, he's mainly photographing famous people and he's referencing it meanwhile. This isn't anyone famous. This is an artist model. So he's using artist models as if, you know, he is an artist. And the most important thing about symbolism is, or sorry, pictorialism. Pictorialism is sort of the equivalent of symbolism in painting. But the really the main thing is soft focus. Nothing is really in focus in this photograph. And this is the first in a series of seven photographs um, by F. Holland Day, which depict Christ. And so they're the seven last words of Christ. That's the name of this series. And there's sort of this unconventional way of taking the photograph. He's purposefully leaving it out of focus. He's purposely making it sort of jarring. And uh, this is suggesting that there's something deeper than just the image here. So... Beyond just the image, this is actually F. Holland Day himself. So he's photographing himself as Jesus. Uh, he thinks he's Jesus. Haha. <laughs> but um, it's more than just an image of himself. It's an image that means what the words mean. So the seven last words of Christ is actually seven phrases that he says while that Jesus says while he's being crucified. And so the first is, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And so clearly. This beyond just a photograph of Jesus, it's he's looking up at God and saying this to him. So because it's addressed to Father. And then he's looking back and saying, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Then he looks down. He looks down at the woman at his feet, as in uh, the, the mortals on the ground, you know. And so they say, woman, or he says, woman, behold thy son. And then he looks up again. And clearly now his face is full of anguish. And the focus is even softer than before. It's an extremely soft focus now. Because this, Jesus is now in a moment of extreme passion, of extreme anguish. He's now starting to sort of question things. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And now he's totally forlorn. He's begun to become resigned to his fate, and he says, I thirst. Into thine hands I commend my spirit. And then finally, it is finished. This is perhaps the most famous of the seven photographs. Purposefully, uh, F. Hollande is sort of uh, cut off there. And it's an unconventional way of taking the photograph, but in a way it's more powerful. Anyway. F. Hollande had an enemy in the photographic world. He had a big, big enemy, and it was Alfred Stieglitz. Stieglitz, they were enemies because they both wanted to do basically the same thing. They both wanted to elevate photography to a fine art that appealed deep within the person. And at least in the first phase of Stieglitz's career, he was also a pictorialist. They were of the same art movement. They both wanted to become really famous, but Stieglitz ended up basically winning the fight. Stieglitz became way more famous, and he became known as the world's greatest photographer, period, for the time. He started a photographic journal, um, and, and which became the most important photographic journal. Copies of it are sold in auctions, and uh, he owned the most popular art gallery in New York. Sadly, it's closed today. Well, closed like 50 years ago. But Stieglitz was an important guy. And so this photograph, we can see it's very clearly pictorialist. It's taken in a very unconventional way. It's not rule of thirds. It's more like rule of sixth. It's take, and it's in very soft focus. It's pictorialist, but he starts to transition. Uh, here, this is also pictorialist. It's in a very soft focus. This is actually a photograph of Stieglitz's daughter. But this begins to shift. I should make a note about the timeline here because it becomes a little bit difficult to move the timeline. There are technically those who started taking photographs after Stieglitz, but were still pictorialist. But there are also those of the next movement who started in the middle of Stieglitz's career. So because of that, I'm going to have to show some photographs from the movement after pictorialism and also pictorialism afterward. It, it gets a little bit strange, but bear with me. Um, it's mainly that Stieglitz uh, begins to move into the movement after pictorialism, which is called modernism. 
And so this photograph here is mostly pictorialist, but he's moving into modernism. So what's the difference here? It is pictorialist in a way that is still soft focus. You, the, the buildings here are still sort of blurry, especially the building in the background. But modernism is about deep focus. Well, there isn't that the here, but it's also about geometry. It's about that sim uh, what the modernists believed is that the pictorialists were idiots. They believed that the pictorialists were too shallow, that yes, they were symbolic, yes, they meant something deeper than the photograph itself, but the depth of it was something that was too obvious, such as the seven last words of Christ. It's, it's so obvious that you can just literally take the words from the Bible, match it up with the image, and it's very clearly the same. The modernists wanted something deeper. The modernists something, wanted something that you had to think about, that you had to consider, that actually made you question yourself. And in that way, it's actually better in a way that the, the photograph isn't just something that you can take in a moment that you can just glance at and say, oh, that looks cool. It's something that you have to think about. And here you see geometry. He's taking houses and buildings. This is a skyscraper that's rising up um, and turn them into geometric shapes. So think about what that is. It's people's dwellings. People live there. People, these are people, uh, people's livelihoods. And he just takes this man on the street and is he really a man anymore? He's not a man anymore. He's a line. This is not a bush anymore. It's a rectangle. These are not houses anymore. They're lines receding into space with one point perspective. This is not a skyscraper anymore. It's some sort of pencil trace. It's almost like it's an arrangement of shapes and not anymore just a picture of buildings. So you need to think about it more. You need to look at how he arranges the shapes. The fact that this man is staying so straight, he didn't, Stieglitz did not ask the man to stand there. It's out of chance, but modernists value chance. It makes you wonder about what chance really is, what, what chance feels like, and can you manipulate chance? And this is a photograph that changed everything. This is a photograph that signaled the beginning of modernism, the true beginning of modernism, and made the world turn to modernism completely. And it's called the steerage. There's a bit of a story to this photograph. This was on a ship to Europe. Um, and Stieglitz being, you know, the most popular art impresario, the, the most powerful avant-garde artist in the world, he was sitting in first class with his very wealthy wife, who he hated, and uh, a group of other bourgeois folks. He hated being there. He hated how stifling it was, and he, he hated his family, frankly. So he decided to go for a walk. He decided to take a look in the steerage, which is where the lower class folks were taking their trip, and he saw this scene. And he suddenly saw, first of all, just how many people were in the steerage. These were mostly immigrants to America who were taking a trip home to perhaps bring back some money, bring back some goods, you know, just visit family. So this is, he saw first the immigrant story. But then, just like the photograph before, taking people, taking dwellings, taking people's livelihoods and sort of disconfiguring it, sort of removing that and just making it uh, shapes, he saw people, but not just people, he saw a hat. And he suddenly saw that the sun was reflecting off the hat in a remarkably bright way, such that the brightest value in the entire photograph is a hat, and the hat is two circles. So he said, with this photograph, there's no rule of thirds. There's no rules anymore. Or is, or are there? So it may seem, if you look at it at first, the largest uh, feature is probably this, this drawbridge here and this very powerful line here. And if you look on those two elements, you'd say there's no rule of thirds because it cuts it almost in half. But then if you look at the hat and try to readjust the image around the hat, yes, there is actually rule of thirds. The hat is in the top third. So the subject isn't actually what's most pronounced in the photograph. It's actually what's, what has the highest exposure. It's actually what is the brightest. And in other words, he's making circles, not people. Despite the fact that there's so many people, 
and it's a ship, he's not making the ship the subject. He's not making the people the subject. He's making circles the subject. But anyway, he wasn't actually walking with his camera, unfortunately. And it was totally by chance that the guy leaned down and was in the sun. So he immediately sprinted back, hoped to God that the man would still be in the same spot, came back with his, photo with his camera, and set it up. Remember that the cameras back then are super bulky and, and take a long time to expose. Very, very fortunately for the history of photography, that guy stood still and we have this photograph now. But as time went on, he got more and more modernist. Here we see deep focus, that everything is in focus. It's a very high f-stop. And these two photographs are of Stieglitz's second wife. This is the woman that he actually loved. And her name is Georgia O'Keeffe, or was Georgia O'Keeffe. She was an abstract painter, so like him, an artist. And she was also a modernist, and, and she was a painter, and um, she, create, she created this, these beautiful modern works. In fact, um, she's probably more well-known than Stieglitz today. But Stieglitz, being completely in love, created these, these two photographs, among many, many others, of Georgia O'Keeffe. On the left one, you wouldn't think that the title of this photograph is actually Hands. It's not my wife, it's not George O'Keefe, it's not even untitled, it's hands. Why is that? Again, in the modernist style, he's not actually taking a photograph of a person. You might see it as a loving picture of a wife by a husband. It's not, it's actually the geometry of the hands. So many modernists are interested in this scientific, technological, mathematical, fundamental quality of shapes, of geometry, of the interplay of shapes. And they try to get people, try, they try to get the models to contort themselves. Um, and the photographs are mainly through the models contorting themselves into geometric shapes. In this case, the hands are contorted into lines, into curves, into triangles, into this sort of quadrilateral here. It shapes again. And in this case, it's a nude but she's not naked. Interesting, because this is a nude photograph, but it's more about curves than actual nudity. Um, this is not sexualized, right? It's, it's not like she's, she's, you know, flaunting anything and, and there's no sort of, it's, it's sort of a brazen nudity that she doesn't care. But the fact that her hand comes and sort of squeezes her breast, the fact that this plant, I don't know what plant that is, but she's admiring the plant and that her neck is creamed in this way. Everything is a curve in this photograph. So again, it's not actually a nude, it's curves, which is strange to think about. But, and, and here's where the timeline gets a little bit strange. Because Steichen, Edward Steichen, he's originally from Luxembourg, came to America because he was totally, totally in love with the work of Stieglitz, and he wanted to be part of Stieglitz's uh, journal. He wanted to be featured in camera work, and Stieglitz absolutely loved St Steichen's work, and so Stieglitz featured Steichen quite a lot in camera work, uh, camera work is the name of his journal. And, but Steichen is not a modernist. Steichen was a pictorialist through and through, so the timeline gets a little bit weird, because Steichen was Stieglitz's friend in the early phase of Stieglitz's career. But anyway, Steichen here, is really, this is really, really, really soft focus. Um, it's, it's sort of like, the, it feels like a charcoal drawing, and that's purposeful. This is not actually technically a photograph, it's a photogravure. And a photogravure is basically taking a photograph and transferring that onto metal to create a print. And so you have the, this feeling as if it was etched into some stone. So here, he, he specializes in this photogravure technique that is super soft focus, that makes it feel sort of shimmery. And it's really the highest achievements of the pictorialist style. But I really like who's featured here. This is Auguste Rodin, and here's his thinker. And so it's almost like he's thinking about the thinker, which is thinking about something else, and cool little assemblage here. But Rodin, Rodin, and Steichen were very good friends. Steichen took a lot of photographs of Rodin, and many of them were published in camera work. Anyway, this, these two photographs, I think, really highlight what pictorialism is all about. This is a photograph of the Flatiron Building in New York. 
but instead of just a flat iron building, he has these sort of branches that come down and create this sort of frame within a frame. And it's this weird symbolic sort of feeling that it sort of gives you this creepy feeling, right? The shimmery symbolic feeling. That's what pictorialism is all about. And same thing here. He has found a random lake, but gives you this super, super soft focus. Makes it feel weird. But on the other hand, in the later phase of Stieglitz's career, he really loved to feature in camera work Charles Sheeler and Paul Strand. So most of the time, these two guys are actually put way separate, but I put them together for a reason. This photograph is by Charles Sheeler. It's really fantastic. It's the River Rouge Ford plant. So this is uh, one of Ford's plants where they manufacture cars um, in Michigan. But what's interesting here is that Beyond just, uh, you can see very clearly that it's not just, you know, a plant, it's not just a factory. Very clearly here are lines. This is a curve. It's more about the geometry. It's more about how light happens. It's sort of a scientific photograph. But also there's this interest in industry. Modernists love to analyze industry. And, you know, just the power and technology that is advancing in this period of the Industrial Revolution and um, and so during the Industrial Revolution, they see this as sort of the worker gaining significance. A lot of modernists were very strong leftists. Um, and so they saw this Industrial Revolution as socialism on the rise, that the world will become a better place. Um, of course, we know what happened after it. But this, on the other hand, is by Paul Strand. And you see again, this is all deep focus. You know, you can see the windows here pretty clearly. But this is so interesting that he has the interplay of light and dark. There's sort of an unnatural darkness to this building. It feels like it shouldn't be that dark. But he makes it that way. He plays around with the exposure and the printing techniques such that this building is this dark. So then it can function as a rectangle of its own. So you have, you know, rectangle, rectangle, and fence which is many, many, many rectangles. And it's sort of a background, middle ground, foreground technique. And so here's a Charles Sheila that is very similar to that Paul Strand that we saw. Again, you know, it's sure it's a door. There's something architectural to this, but it's deep focus. And again, we have such an amazing interplay of shapes. He's way more interested in the shadow here uh, and how the shadow matches a door. So it's not just this random placement of a door. It's placed so that the shadow here matches, right? The shape of the door's top and the shadow here. So modernism has these little tiny details that are so amazing when you, when you gaze closely. When you look closely at the photographs, you begin to notice these things and also the strength of the light. It's bathed in this light that here you also see the really strong shade here. But I feature them together because they came together and created a documentary, which is the most amazing like silent short film ever. I'll play for you just a minute of it. Uh, here we go. Oh, either way, so this is in 1921. It's a uh, short film documentary style uh, creation. It's more about photographs really um, of New York. This is trying to show New York in a developing way and in the industry of New York rising up and how people are immigrating into New York. And as usual in modernist photography, pay attention to the shapes.
Yep. So I think this is just one of the greatest photographs of all time. Like, wow. This is actually Wall Street. This is what Wall Street looked like in the 20s. <laughs> Imagine that. Now it's some high rise, but like the interplay between the, these massive things <laughs> and the people. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so one of Stieglitz's greatest fans, uh, was Ansel Adams. He was a huge fan of Stieglitz and when he became, when Adams became a photographer, um, he wanted Stieglitz's approval. So he sent over a portfolio. Stieglitz told him that this is the greatest work I've ever seen. And Stieglitz was right. Ansel Adams. I have to emphasize, is the most famous, the most important, the most influential photographer in all of American history. And this is one of his works. This is in Taos Pueblo in the Southwest. Um, Adams is famous as a landscape photographer. He was the greatest of the modernists. Well, the greatest of all time, but certainly a leader of the modernists. He founded a group called F slash 64. Now, photographers will know that that's not F slash, it's F stop 64. Um, and the, what the F stop is, is the depth of field, the, the, how deep the focus goes. And F slash 64 is very, 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 very high. So that means that everything needs to be in extremely crisp focus. And you see that here. Look at the texture of this entryway. It's so crisp, like you can see the little tiny piece of stucco there. And Adams came up with this system. He called it the zone system. It was basically his idea of exposure. He said that all exposure, every single light value in the photograph needs to be along these, uh, it was either 11 or 12, I think 12 different light values. So in other words, you have to, you can take a section of an image and it has to align with one of these 12, and there has to be a certain number of sections that align with this, a certain number of sections that align with that number, a certain number of sections that align with that number. So in other words, it's extremely difficult to do, especially in this time period. Um, however, somehow he did it, just out of how experienced he was and how skillful. And you can see that it, it works, right? That the difference between this area of the photograph and the difference, and, and this area of the photograph, it's an extreme difference. Somehow, he waited here for a very long time, waited until the light was just right so that this is in shadow, this edge here is in very bright light, but the doorway itself, like the flat face of the doorway, is not in complete light, it's only in partial light. And he waited until this precise moment to take this photograph. So then we get bright, or well, sky, and then bright edge, then really dark face, then another bright edge, and then this beautiful, beautiful sort of intermarriage between light and dark. It's absolutely wonderful. And here we see two of his most famous photographs. He's most famous for photographing Yosemite National Park. This is specifically the mountain named Half Dome. And this photograph in 1927 was one of his earliest really, really successful uses of exposure. There's an amazing story to this photograph. He was climbing Yosemite. He was an amazing environmentalist um, that he wanted to preserve the outdoors. He really, really fought hard. He was one of the great fighters for national parks. But beyond that, he also loved being in the outdoors. He was a great mountain climber. And he was climbing Yosemite for however many hundred times. And um, suddenly, he looked at Half Dome, this great peak here. And he said, oh my God, it, it truly was transcendental. It truly was an awakening for him, in him, this philosophical awakening. And he said, how can I capture that on film? How can I capture that into a photograph? It seemed to him to be almost impossible that whenever he captured it, the tones didn't feel as dramatic in real life, as real life. It didn't feel as powerful. It didn't give him the same feeling. And he just tried again and again and again. Remember how long the exposures were back in, back at this time. And also how film was expensive and not that easy to keep track of. You know, you had to use glass plates. Uh, film was not that bendy. 
Um, and of course, today we don't even need to use film anymore. But he was running low on plates when he was here, and he was taking a really long time, you know. And slowly, he was on his last one or two plates, his last one or two photographs left on his film. And suddenly, he got an epiphany. He took a red filter and put it in front of the camera. And the effect that created was that the sky instantly became completely blacked out. And that meant that the sky was blacked out. So you, you see blackness, then the shimmering edge, then blackness. And then he took that photograph and realized, I don't need to take any more. This is the one. And he, that was his discovery of the system in which if you make the light value strong enough, if you make the contrast strong enough, you create something powerful. And for him, this photograph was able to reproduce um, that power. In his later years, you can see this is one of his late works, he still has that extreme ability to control his exposure. And he also has, like the other modernists, um, this geometric feeling. Half dome here looks sort of like a rectangle. But in his later years, he would want to capture the moon. So here, there's a poetry to capturing the moon. He, the moon serves as this poetic barrier, so that the top third, the subject is a moon. That's only the other two thirds, the only other two vertical thirds, that the subject is actually the mountain. So the moon and the mountain sort of have this dialogue. But this is extremely, extremely well done in this photograph. Moonrise, Hernandez, New Mexico. This is Ansel Adams' most famous photograph. Um, technically, I could actually get in trouble with uh, putting this here because this being the most famous photograph, Ansel Adams is really good at promoting his photographs. And so he still actually, even though he's dead, he's long dead, uh, his company still licenses out all his photographs and they're super successful just out of how famous he is. But nonetheless, Let's look at this photograph. The story goes that he was driving along on the highway in New Mexico after a long day of photo shoots. The sun was setting, um, and it was the last few minutes, the very, very last few minutes of daylight that the sun has, you know, was, was going down the horizon. And suddenly he looked off to the side and saw this image of Hernan, the little town of Hernandez, New Mexico. And he saw the graveyard, and he saw that the sun, you know, if you think over here is a sun, the sun was coming over and hitting the graves. Look very closely at this gravestone, then at this gravestone. The sun was hitting the gravestones at the exact right angle that the gravestones shimmered. They reflected the light right back at him. And he was like, I need to take this photograph. But he only had, people estimate, three to five minutes to take this photograph. He immediately stops the car and silently, not saying a word, there were assistants with him. And they had no idea what he was doing. But he jumped out, got out his, his uh, everything that he had, and, and um, which at this time was a lot, right? A tripod, a camera. He had a, needed an exposure meter and the glass plates, the film, etc. But he realized he didn't have time. Three to five minutes, right? He just lowered the plate, didn't use the exposure meter, didn't even need to look through anything. All he needed to do was just glance at the image, load in the plate, bam, take the photograph. And that was that, and he caught this amazing thing. Somehow, in three to five minutes, he got that shimmering light. That's all the time he needed. And it's just terrific. I mean, how can you top this photograph that, again, he has that magical formula? The mountains just accentuate here also. But the magical formula of dark, then light, then dark, and then these little jewels. The grays are almost like jewels. It's, it's absolutely brilliant. But he has more, which is really fantastic, right? This, is, this, this photograph exudes tranquility, makes you feel tranquility. It's, it's not just about um, one subject in general. It's about the overall composition of the photograph. Even though it's in deep focus, you still feel the mist. This is in Glacier National Park. Um, here's another national park. It's Grand Teton. This is a Snake River running through. 
This is one of his most often reproduced uh, photographs. The proportions, for one, like you actually can't take this photograph anymore because all this forest has basically gone. It's it's been flooded. It's been terraformed. It's been everything. You can't take a photograph like this anymore. And in this time, 1942, you could take color photographs. He doesn't. Because what a lot of people don't understand is that black and white does not mean absence of color. Black and white, technologically, yes. Technologically, that might mean that you don't have access to color. But more importantly, black and white means the power of light. That with color, the light is sort of filtered away, that, that you're more attracted to the colors. But when you use black and white, that he purposefully used black and white in this case, he didn't, he refused to use color. Black and white accentuates the shadows and light and the interplay between them, because that's all there is. And just like that, the sun's reflection on the water here, it accentuates that and makes it all that more beautiful. Anyway, so, he's, so Ansel Adams had this group, F-64, or f 64 He, one of the other members in the group was Edward Weston. Edward Weston had this amazing saying, or quote, that I unfortunately don't remember in full, and I'm going to paraphrase it. He said that a rock, or when you take a photograph of a rock, it has to look like a rock, it has to be identifiable as a rock, it has to remind you of a rock, but it cannot be a rock. Interesting, interesting, interesting. What does it mean? What does that mean? So he's a modernist as well. This photograph is of a bell pepper. But what is it also of? It looks like a bell pepper. It reminds you of a bell pepper. It clearly is a bell pepper. But it's also two people going at it. <laughs> it's some sort of sexual image. And it's not clear what exactly, what exactly they're doing. But it's some person... Either one person or two people, however you see this, and they're being intimate somehow. They're, they're nude, and they're being intimate, or, or one person is being intimate, they're posing, and it's literally just a bell pepper. He literally just found a bell pepper somewhere, and was able to find one that was disfigured in a way such that it expressed that, and then took it, took a photo, as if he was taking a photo of a nude. This is lit as if it was a nude, with this really, really strong lighting from the top right there. So that's the idea. It's clearly a bell pepper, but it's also not. Interesting enough, this is a nude woman, but it's not a nude woman. It clearly is identifiable as a woman, but she hides her face, she is contorted. Very, very, very similarly with Stieglitz's uh, photos of um, George O'Keefe, his second wife, the same thing occurs here, that the photographer makes the model contort herself, and by doing that, they, they, they gain the geometry in the body. It's not about nudity. It's not about sexuality. It's not about genitalia. It's about the, the figure of the body. It's about the form of the body. And this here, uh, it's, it's even difficult to, if you haven't seen this photograph before, it may be very difficult to even see what that is. It's a shell. It's a nautilus shell. But it's, again, lit in a way that might be a swimmer, might be a lamp, right? It's, it, it doesn't seem like it. And that beautiful, beautiful contrast between the very bright interior of the shell and the background. How did he do it? I have no idea. You're going to have to read a book about Edward Weston, I guess. Here are some other photographs I did. Again, capturing the woman here in this moment in which she's sort of garish as a woman, but very interesting as an object, which that seems very sexist, that seems really, really misogynist to say, but it's feminist in many other ways. Because nudes in all of art, a lot of art historians say they're not really, they're nudes, but they're not naked. Because they still have around them the pretensions of men. That men, that there are so many female nudes because men want to see women naked. I mean, it's true that they're always, if you look at all the nudes in art, it's always the most beautiful, supple versions of women, the most idealized versions of women. But in this case, this is not idealized. It may seem at first like it's being, it's objectifying, turning the woman into an object, but more importantly, 
it's turning her into something that isn't actually objectified. It's not for a social, not for a sexual reason. It's for the reason of that. Well, she is a woman. That she is a human. It's a human portrait. And this was、um, in the very late life of、uh, Weston, Edward Weston. He took photographs of his home in、uh, Point Lobos, California, or near his home. And Point Lobos is known for these beaches that are really, really rocky and craggy, and also these craggy trees. So here he really evokes a sort of Ansel Adams type feeling, and so he might be learning from his friend. Anyway, so. We have this American modernist movement, but this is not modernism exactly in painting. It's it's the modernism in photography, but the modernists in painting actually also take photographs. Very interestingly, Man Ray, he was born American. His name is not his real name isn't Man Ray, but he went by Man Ray. Yes, if you think that's funny, there's actually a photographer who went by the name Ouija. But. Man Ray lived for most of his life in Paris. He was a member of the Dada movement, and Dada—he was one of the most important Dadaists. And the Dada were were, were the first, one of the first anti-art movements, really the, the first. They they were talking about creating something that didn't have logic.、Right? Normally, in the modernists, they try to emphasize geometry. They try to emphasize this mathematical side to the world, and there's a logic there by using geometry. They're、reducing everything to a basic logic. Man Ray is doing the opposite. He's still a modernist for sure, but in the way that it's more surreal. Dadaists were seen as sort of the predecessor to the surrealists, and this is clearly nonsensical. It's funny. It's it's a joke. It's this is a photograph named Porte Manteau. That's actually French for the coat stand. So it's a woman. Turn into a coat stand. I get it. It's about the objectification of women. Woohoo! And it's it's sort of funny because she's wearing a black sock, but if you look at it first, it's like she doesn't have the bottom of her leg. And also, if you look even closer,、um, it's almost like she's in a studio. But then the rug just runs out, and it's just random tiled floor. And you know, there's even more that her that she has pubic hair, but it's covered very, very, very.、Um, Tastefully, by the metal coat stand, and、um, although the most sexualized parts of her body are being shown, the actual identifying part of her body is covered by this sort of like childlike, stupid, idiotic,、um, strange paper covering, and that's a sort of joke. Dadaism is about jokes. It's about having this disillusioned jokes about art, and in creating jokes.、Uh, Man Ray was part of Dada for the first part of his career. He actually moved into surrealism, and so this these are identifiable more with surrealism. These he called rayographs, so they're not photographs, they're rayographs. And the reason for that today we actually call them photograms. What photograms are?、Um, they are taken without a camera. So he he would take、um, film in a dark room and put objects on the film and then expose them to light. So he never actually uses a camera. He just exposes the film, and so, for instance, in this case, what looks like a slinky, he just puts it on the film and then shines light on it. But what's interesting is, you sort of get the feeling that you know what the object is, but it's never what the object really is. Like, I have no idea what this actually is, but it's definitely not a slinky. Now, take my word for it. What is this? Nobody may know. This looks sort of like a trumpet.、Um, But what is this? You know, what is this going on here? What is this smoke? Well, how did he do that? Who knows? <laughs> It's surrealism. It's sort of like the dreamlike quality of humanity. That you look at this and you sort of just associate with objects that you've seen already, and it's analyzing the dreams. Here, who knows what this metal rod? Who knows where he got this sort of piece of metal here? It just exists. Is there even a point in questioning? Is it even a point in trying to find out what it is?、Um, this is also interesting. He, he, surrealists are interested in taking what is familiar and making it unfamiliar. You know, surrealists would often would often paint an elephant, but then the lower half of the elephant would be like a bowl, and then there'd be like cherries for feet.、Um, in this case, this is a woman, but 
this is not how you see a woman. This is, he's using some optical effects to make it so that it's completely, you've never seen a woman like this before. Well, perhaps today, since we have digital effects and everything, but you get the point. In this case also, you get the idea that it's sort of a lamp, but people don't see lamps like this. He's trying to do things with a camera and with film that normally you wouldn't see in real life. It's something that is only, only exists in this dream world. And here are two more rayographs that I think are absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, this, sort of a little bit phallic. And that's interesting because it might be just be a needle and maybe ice cubes, who knows. But he gives you sort of these, these uh, strange little funny, sometimes jokes, inside the photographs. Um, like for instance here, this looks sort of like a gun, but instead of a trigger, like this is clearly just a beer bottle or well, what looks like a beer bottle, but this sort of trigger slash mag magazine thing turns into a mushroom looking thing. And then there's just beads coming out of it. So you realize that it's not a gun, who knows? It's this funny idea that you can tort a gun into something that's not something that you would see only in a dreamland. And uh, this is actually Man Ray. This is what he looks like. And this is a portrait taken by someone who at the time was the leading portraitist uh, with a camera, I mean, photographic portraitist. And so he functions a lot like Nadakh because all the famous people in America, so he's American, whereas Nadakh is French, um, he was really, the man who all the cultural elite wanted to take, want to have their photographs taken by. He was known as this avant-garde photographer and he took some of the most interesting photographs of people ever. So on the left here, we have Ella Fitzgerald, um, but he, being a modernist, decides to do things his way. Um, instead of using the rule of thirds, she's in this really uncomfortable position visually it's not rule of thirds, it's, it's no rule whatsoever. She has the weirdest headroom in the world, right? Why? I didn't, that photograph wasn't edited, it's, it's not cropping, it's, it's just that way. But this makes it more interesting. The fact that you haven't seen a photograph like this before makes it a little bit more interesting. And also, it's evoking the fact that she is a singer, and so she is, she seems to be singing. And this is Norman Mailer. So there's purposeful blowing out. There's purposeful making the exposure too high and blowing out sections of the photograph, sections of the face even, to make it um, feel, well, different, new. Because Norman Mailer should feel new. Norman Mailer was a writer. He was known for challenging the government. All, everything he wrote was basically about how awful the government is. And so just like he challenges convention in his writings, this photograph challenges conventions, challenges what light should be in a photograph. Um, and also he looks questioningly, questioningly at the viewer as he questions the government, right? And also we see that just like Nadar, he does not use the modern way we light. He does not use a studio light system. Normally when we take a portrait, we use a three point light system. Uh, we have three lights so that the face is very, is lit very flatly and, and, uh, is very evenly lit. In this case, this is actually Orson Welles. And Orson Welles' face is partially lit very bright. And then it sort of recedes. We saw that in Norm Mailer a second ago as well, that the middle of his face wasn't lit. So he plays around with the light to try and get as far away as the standard studio lighting as possible. This, um, is, uh, oh darn, what's your name? Um, Gertrude Stein, that's it. Did someone say Gertrude Stein? There you go, yeah. But Gertrude Stein was one of Carl Van Vechten's um, very, very good friends. In fact, uh, when, I believe when Stein died, Vechten was actually in charge of her estate. And so it makes sense that he'd take a, at least one portrait of her. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's absolutely wonderful that she's framed with a background of an American flag. If you know anything about Gertrude Stein, she uh, sort of hated America. She left America for France. Um, she was one of the so-called lost generation. Um, so, you know, interesting framing there. But from, so Van Vechten and Man Ray, they're sort of part of these uh, formal art establishments. Dorothy Lange pioneered a different style of photography or a different, a new, brand new um, way of photography that sort of recalled Edward S. Curtis, but in a new way. This is documentary photography. So Dorothy Lange, her most famous photograph is Migrant Mother. Um, you've probably all seen this, but it's, it's set in a depression. And this is important because whereas um, Edward S. Curtis, he generally takes photographs, documentary culture. This is documentary culture in a very specific time with a very, very specific point. She, it's not just documenting, it's documenting with such a specific point at a very specific time. Dorothy Lange, she worked in a completely different way compared to all the photographers before her. She didn't, cameras in the mid-century began to get a little bit less bulky, began to take a little bit less time to expose, and so she could take the camera around and walk up to someone and begin talking to them and converse with them and get to know their story and snap several snapshots of them. And then she could choose one of those to actually print. This is very important. It's not like Ansel Adams taking one photograph that's the best. It's taking the most poignant moment out of several. And it's also getting to know the people first. It's the subject is almost part of the photograph. And in this case especially, um, I don't need to tell you that much about this photograph except that it's in California, it's during the Great Depression. You can probably already tell me that these are Okies, that they've gone to California because their land has dried up and they're seeking a better life. Um, but with this photograph, this shows that Dorothy Lange, unlike Edward S. Curtis, Curtis um, just wanted to document a culture to make people aware of them. He, they, he was sympathetic, but he didn't necessarily want to make change now. Hein, yes, he wanted to make change now, but he didn't have moments, right? With Lange, she made moments, and she also wanted change, very, very specifically. It is not always, this is the Manzanar war camp. Um, this was one of the camps uh, that Japanese Americans were sent to during World War II. Um, FDR basically made an executive order forcing the Japanese into these relocation camps, which are basically concentration camps. You know, it was one of the darkest times in American history. And Dorothy Lange opposed this. Dorothy Lange wanted to close the war camps. So when the United States Army asked her to please document uh, the, you know, you're our greatest, you're the most famous documentary photographer in America right now. Uh, they also asked Ansel Adams, by the way. They asked Ansel Adams and Dorothy Lange. And so you're the most famous landscape and documentary photographers. Please take photographs of Manzanar War Camp to show people that it's not that bad because the army is in charge of these camps. Now, Ansel Adams being a landscape photographer and a modernist, he didn't believe in photo photography's ability to change people's minds necessarily. So he took, you know, standard sort of landscape photographs that were very beautiful. Lange waited until the moment a dust storm came up and waited for the dust storm so she could take the snapshot of people, this huge American flag that, you know, saying that, you know, these people are still Americans and this dust storm to show that they're in awful living conditions. So in other words, she completely betrayed the army. This is absolutely terrific because here also she shows that these are people who are suffering, but they're also Americans, you know, she, she published these two photographs in tandem. And so when you look at these together, awful conditions. Um, but an American flag, an American flag, and who's under the American flag? Americans who are suffering, old people, young people alike, you know. She's stirring our hearts. It's sort of sensationalized, but it's for a point. She's interested in photography as a social change. So that's documentary photography. And continuing that, Diane Arbus, also use a sort of technique of um, taking photo of getting to know a subject and then taking their photograph several times 
uh, creating these moments. They, um, they're portrayed in a very standard pose, just taking a smoke break. It's something that's very natural. It's something that, well, in, especially in this time period, a lot of people did. Now take this kid. Is, she doing, is, is he doing something that's normal? No, right? He's holding two grenades. And this is, oh, oh, one grenade. Whoops. But in Central Park, this is Central Park. It looks like he's a terrorist and he's going to blow something up, but he's a kid. But he's normal. So in other words, we have the normal treatment, the, the, the regular treatment of a unnormal person, but a quote-unquote normal person is treated strangely. So, this is an interest in um, making these people, questioning the idea of normalcy. This is, you should recognize this photograph, it's in The Shining. Kubrick, who directed The Shining, um, was a photographer when he started out. So it makes sense that he knew about Arbus' work and copied it. But in this case, these are two very normal teens, or not teens, twins. <sighs> These are two very normal twins, but there's something really strange about them. It's like their, their eyes, like they're shifty. They're weird. Something's really, really weird about them. But is there anything weird about twins? So that's what Arbus is asking. Um, she's capturing a moment. Again, she gets to know her subject, then takes a lot of photographs, and she purposely finds the one photograph that is the most alienating, the most strange photograph. Um, and that idea of the moment, of capturing the moment, was best typified by Henri Cartier-Bresson, a French phot photographer, um, and he believed in the idea of the decisive moment. That, that when you took a photograph, ultimately your goal was to find the very moment that was most indicative of the person, most important to the subject, and to really take find that moment and capture it onto film. So Presson here takes a photograph of a sculptor named Alberto Giacometti. And so he was an Italian sculptor. Uh, he's one of the most well-known sculptors of the modern era. And he takes the photograph to try and typify uh, the way that he works. So he's setting up an exhibition here and you can see that he was running about. He's very fervent with his work. And so all he needs is one photograph to sort of tell a story, to try to show you that Giacometti is really fervent. Um, you can sort of see him running around, you know, you can sort of see the scene play out, but it's just one photograph. Similarly, you know, this is capturing the very, very moment. This is in Italy, and it's capturing the very moment when, you know, this person's here, and this person down here is here, and it creates this wonderful geometric composition that it's taking, Pressant here is taking a lot of um, lessons from the modernists. It's very geometric, but the reason why it can be geometric is because of the moment created by the people being here. It's a coincidence. This also, you know, it's, it's, this is in France, and it's this very moment that gives you this visual splendor. The, the, the moment of um, this bicyclist being right here, like how lucky was he to catch that, right? But it's not luck, it's skill. That he can see things that are going to happen and he can take that. Um, and that gives you this sort of visual interest as your eye runs down the banister and you know gets to him. The cyclist here. So Presson did not consider himself a documentary photographer, he was a street photographer. He photographed people out on the street and, and um, they were oftentimes in these sort of interesting situations where the nation was in an interesting situation. Um, this is all the way in the 30s, sort of a tumultuous time for France, you know, as, as World War looms. And so we have Presson, Cartier Presson is expressing tumult, but not in taking pictures of the front lines not in taking pictures of war at all, rather this one old guy. That gives you a general sense of dread instead of, you know, war. So this is the most, he's saying that in a way, the streets 
of war are more poignant than war itself. The streets and the people of a nation, that's who is most important. That's the people who are affected the most by war. This is in Greece. And it's just a really, really beautiful photograph of a child. You know, the, the geometric composition, the depth, you know, the wonderful cascading of the geometry there. But also, I think this is the best summation of Bresson's, Cartier Bresson's um, work in the street. This is in Beijing. It's 1948. Beijing at this time was in a huge amount of tumult. This was a Chinese civil war that had just picked up again. After World War II ended, the Chinese civil war sort of restarted um, and it was absolutely a bloodbath. It is undeniable that millions perished. It was, it was beyond insane that governments would change. Like Beijing would be under one government one day, one government the next. And yet, in the streets of Beijing, so he's capturing this at the time of the Civil War, but instead of cannons or anything, he's going in the street and just looking at this one old guy eating rice or whatever that is, something. So in other words, he's more interested in the people of the streets. So in a way, he captures war in a better way by humanizing the people of that country. So when he brings his photograph back to France and exhibits it, it's a sort of post-colonial uh, way of dealing with war. In that, he's basically saying that, what goal do we have to go to foreign countries and capture their, their whore um, with all this violence? What, what right do we have? Instead, let's go capture what the country really is. It's sort of post-colonial. It's, it's saying that France is no longer an empire. You know, there's a really, really deep meaning to these photographs. And Cartier Bresson was sort of like Stieglitz. He was really, really influential, incredibly influential. He started a group named Magnum Photos. And Magnum Photos, one of their members, well, he was actually never a confirmed member. He Basically, he was a member. His name was Danny Lyon. And Magnum Photos, it's very important to talk about Cartier Bresson, even though this is an presentation about America because Magnum Photos had a lot of American members. And Danny Lyon was one of those American members and uh, the EPA in the 70s, the Environmental Protection Agency, hired, had this program called Documerica. They hired these photographers, some of the greatest street photographers in America to, and photojournalists to go in and take photographs of the streets to try and show the effects of pollution on a multilateral scale. And what was interesting is there are more, all the great photographs that came out of Doc America, almost all of them, were not actually directly about pollution, they're about poverty. And the point was that the most impoverished and the most, and the ethnic minorities especially, those are the people who are being most affected by pollution. And in this case, this is a Doc America photograph by Danny Lyon showing, um, sort of the, the poor ethnic minorities uh, playing in this polluted, sort of unsafe area, right? There, there's graffiti, and there's a lot of lessons learned here from Cartier Bresson. Just like Cartier Bresson treats death with like this, this uh, foreground to background treatment of death, in the background we have the graffiti, in the, for in the middle ground we have the actual subject, the children playing, and then we have a fence for the foreground. There's this amazing treatment of death. But Danny Lyon is probably more famous for photographs that he took of bikers. Um, he's a, Danny Lyon is a New Yorker, but he took a trip to Chicago and joined the biker gang in Chicago. All the, the basically the entire photograph community hated him for doing this because they're like, what are you doing? You're getting too close to your subjects. Biker gangs are dangerous. Don't do it. Whatever you do. But he did it anyway. He came out alive and he took this amazing poignant photograph of a biker looking back. I'm not actually not sure if poignant would be the correct word. It's simply beautiful. It's, it's simply, you know, simple is a better word for it. it it's, there's no pretension about it. And the fact that the biker doesn't look straight into the camera, it almost shows you an inside view. This is what members of the gang would see. 
Um, so similar here, in this case, they're looking at the camera, but it's still this really intimate feeling. That's what Danny Lyon does best. He really captures intimacy, especially in times of tumult. So Danny Lyon is known for, he goes in the middle of the civil rights era, he goes to protests all the time. Still the day actually goes to Occupy route, well, okay, Occupy is not a thing anymore, but, but he just goes to protests all the time and takes pictures of protests. In fact, recently he gave a speech, he's still actually still alive, and recently he gave a speech in which um, he said that Donald Trump's election was the, is the best thing that can happen to a photographer because, and this is my quote, or this is actual quote of him, there will be blood on the streets and we will go photograph it. So he's really happy with blood on the streets. Basically, this guy is a socialist anarchist. He's really strong leftist, but he makes amazing works. And, and this is an example that, that he's interested in this very leftist idea of the minorities being oppressed here, but portraying them as sort of more human. Um, he's very close and intimate with them you get the feeling that he did talk to these people. And this is probably his most famous photograph of the civil rights era. This is in the middle of Selma. As the violence is going down, as police are clashing with the protesters or the marchers, he's here, he's in the middle of it all, taking the photograph of the fallout. And this is so amazing. Immediately your eye is drawn to this woman. And she's looking at the, at the camera as if to say, America, look, look at what is happening. Look at what you're doing to us. Look at, you know, the, the situation. And, you know, newspapers picked this up and, and this was huge. So, but on the left side, it's really terrific that there are also these onlookers looking at what the violence that's going on. And you get the idea that these people are witnessing something just so awful. And it shows on their face. It's, it's absolutely a brilliant piece of work. But also working on the Documerica project was a great photographer, um, a Chicago based photographer, still living in Chicago. Um, I don't think he's working though. I think he retired just a couple years ago. Uh, or she was laid off. He worked for the Chicago Tribune for a long time, but he got laid off, unfortunately. But anyway, John H. White. Also in the 70s, he made these amazing photographs for the Documerica project. And here, we have a more direct treatment of pollution. All this waste here. But mainly the, the minorities. He's saying that the minorities of the south side of Chicago, this is where this is taken, are the people who are feeling the effects of pollution. And he himself uh, is black, is African American. And so he got to actually... Um, get really, really up close with the Nation of Islam, which is, to, uh, today it's sort of considered a um, uh, sort of far, it's sort of fringe group, but they're basically a really strongly Muslim group. They try to ignite, they try to reignite um, the Muslim faith in African American communities. And so this is at a meeting. These were the cadets of the Nation of Islam who were trying to protect um, the people on the stage. So this is a stage and there are, uh, here are the actual worshipers. So the Nation of Islam was this brand of um, Islam that was about African Americans, that was about poverty and, and, and the struggle, and it was fundamental to civil rights. So here is, oh, whoops, ah, no, back, okay. Here is someone who is attending the meeting these are the cadets guarding it. So you have this interesting interplay here. Um, and showing that these people are angry, These the, the, the people who live in the south side of Chicago and impoverished areas like this, they are angry, they want change. And that's what Doc America was about. This was also a Doc America photograph. So interesting, you know, this is a teenager, but get it, it's a sort of a symbol for black power. There you go. Uh, I don't think I really need to explain that. But so William Klein, he was also a street photographer, but he moved into fashion photography. And um, he was an American, but came to Paris uh, and lived in France for most of his life. 
Uh, I can't remember if he's still alive or not. And so here was a photograph that he took while he was still in America. Absolutely fantastic use of depth, like Bresson or Cartier Bresson. Um, you know, you have this strong foreground and receding into a background. And like Bresson, it's this moment. It's this moment capturing the, the strength of youth. It's sort of evoking youth. And here's a photograph they took in Louisiana. And it's, it's like the other photograph. You have this fantastic treatment of the subject in the foreground, the subject in the middle ground, and the subject in the background. This is sort of a beach in Louisiana, and, and you get a sort of rural feeling. You get a sort of homey feeling, but also there's a very interesting story that's sort of being told here that she's sort of outgoing and he's a little bit ashamed. <laughs> he's a little bit disappointed in the woman, but um, it's a story being told within the photograph. So Klein's work in Paris sort of defined this chic uh, couture um, ideology in France in the 60s and 70s of beautiful women with glossy clothes and sort of this avant-garde style to all of fashion. And his work in France gained him the friendship of not just Henri Cartier-Bresson, but a lot of the other cultural elite, which the cultural elite in France allowed him to make a series of films bashing America. This was, um, he directed this film named Mr. Freedom, uh, commenting on, um, how awful America is from the point of view of an expatriate. And um, so I want you to notice how this really isn't a film. It's more like um, a series of photographs that are just strewn together. But yes, you get the idea. So. Um, Moving on to Julius Schulman, I, I really want to highlight at least one architectural photographer. And he's probably the most famous of the architectural photographers. In America, he worked for um, a lot of the most famous architects in America, in California. That was his main area that he worked in. And this is a house called the Stahl House. And wow, what an amazing photograph. Um, he had, he believed in this term that he coined called visual acoustics. And it's basically a fancy way of saying rhythm in photography. There is definitely a rhythm here. Um, in the vert in the horizontal lines, I would say, the horizontal lines of the eaves of the roof here, the vertical lines of the glass moving into the horizontal lines of the city of Los Angeles. Um, so he actually had a lot of work to create this photograph because at this time of night, the lights of Los Angeles are not that bright. He basically created a combination of both exposure tricks within the camera and tricks when printing to make this portion of the photograph way brighter than this portion of the photograph, so that um, most of the so that the photograph isn't actually blown out. The exposure control is absolutely amazing because um, if you look at the photograph before it was printed, like the, the raw negative. This is all black. Somehow, he was able to bring out those lights. And by bringing out the lights, he created the rhythm of the lines that created what he called acoustics, visual acoustics. Here as well, you can see that he has people sort of in the foreground, and then the rhythm that beats toward the Los Angeles City Hall. This is a photograph of Los Angeles City Hall, but instead of just a photograph of Los Angeles City Hall, like anyone can just walk up to LA City Hall and snap a photo of it with a digital camera, he takes the time to wait for this rhythm. It's by complete chance that these people happen to stop here, but it's very fortunate that they did. And in any case, even if they didn't, he would have waited for a similar chance. So he waits for this rhythm to appear. And also, it's not just waiting. It's, it's also that he's framed it in a way that you get rectangle, then rectangle, then the tower. So this is, is 
a fantastic image that he did for Frank Lloyd Wright. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's Hollyhock House in Los Angeles. And the rhythm of this, wow, just the foliage, the plant here, and then the hill in the house itself extending back into the background. Um, I mean, look at, the, look at the geometry of the house. Flat, then out, then flat again, then out. There's a rhythm here. Same thing here that the, the house, this is a um, house that's in Palm Beach. And the house almost feels like an extension of the mountains. All about the framing here. And also, it's not, the mountains are the background, the house is in the midground, and also you have, you've got these chairs in the foreground. It's almost like your eye bounces off them, or, eh, I think it's just as likely to see the middle and then back and then front, but in any case, you're, there is a pattern here that your eye doesn't just stay in one place. It moves around. There's an interest here. But now we sort of are leaving the post, or we're leaving the modernist era. That uh, with these last two photographers, I wanted to just touch very briefly on the postmodern and contemporary eras, which are the eras that we live in today. Um, today we live in the contemporary art world. It is not actually modern art. It, today we call it contemporary art. But contemporary art is really powerfully influenced by postmodernism. And the greatest of the postmodern, well, the most famous of the postmodern photographers is Sidney Sherman. I mean, if you're interested in postmodern photography, Saint Sherman is only one of a very large movement. But um, it's hard to, it's very hard to approach. So I will just uh, highlight this one. Um, this is herself. This is a self-portrait. But it's also not really. Saint Sherman with postmodernism, it's purposefully garish. It's campy. In fact, the word camp was invented for postmodernism. A, a scholar on postmodern art invented it. Um, she, it's campy because it's evoking medieval paintings of the Virgin Mary and also Greek, the portrayal of women in Greek uh, drama. But it's a commentary. It's sort of a feminist commentary on the treatment of women in history in general. She is super dolled up. She does not look like that in real life. She has put on a huge amount of garish makeup, uh, like hair dye and all sorts of eyeshadow, all sorts of shadows, and given herself a very campy setting. You know, it's just this weirdest gold color uh, curtain. The robe here evokes the, um, and the way that light comes off it evokes medieval paintings. This, she literally went down to a local Halloween store and bought a random mask. These are actually fake feet that she also bought at a Halloween store. And so when you just look at it, you're like, well, it's just a really bad photograph of a woman. No, it's deeper. She purposely has these fake feet. It's, they're super oversized and they look like a man's foot or a monster's foot even. So in other words, this is talking about the way that women are dolled up in history. That the fact that they have been objectified, that they are represented in oftentimes sort of sexualized or victim, victimized roles. You know, think about that it's the woman in the Bible that, that kills people and serves their heads on a platter. It's in mythology, women are the, the lustful creatures. And, um, and, but she's most famous, Cindy Sherman is most famous for um, what she calls the untitled film stills. This uh, photograph is one of these. She purposefully makes herself look like she's in a film from the 50s. Uh, and she performs roles that women in the 50s were expected to perform. So she, they're always in black and white, like a 50s movie. And so here she's a librarian. And all of the, there are hundreds of untitled film stills in, in the series. And they're not really from a film. They're photographs that look like they're from a film. But she's performing these sort of stereotypical 50s roles. It's talking about women and how they are always objectified and turned into these um, lower roles. So, you know, here she's a librarian. In this photograph, 
um, she's in the city, but she's lost. It's almost like women shouldn't be in the city. And here, she's in the kitchen. You know, it's almost like it's a cartoon, and she's, she's saying like, oh, no, I'm so distressed. I'm waiting for my husband. It's a parody, right? And, and notice in each time, she looks completely different. She's purposely dolling herself up every time. And here, she's alone and this sort of innocent, femme fatale. But here, interestingly enough, this was made later, and, and it's almost like the aftermath of the untitled film stills. It's almost like the woman is discarded, but one wonders if they really have. You know, uh, she's wondering here, do we still face the same challenges as the 50s? You know, like she's, she's still in the 50s archetype here, but it's no longer a film still. It's now in color. It's now today. And, sh and, um, the woman is still sort of in a, in a bad place, but in a way that is different. They're discarded more and not, um, dolled up. So this is postmodernism. It's purposefully campy. It's, it's revealing something more interesting about culture itself. It's sort of considering culture. And then finally we get to the last photographer who is Annie Leibovitz. She is the most famous contemporary, or she is the most famous living photographer, period. Um, this is a photograph she took, uh, I think the day before John Lennon died. And this is, of course, John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Now, this photograph shows a trademark of Annie Leibovitz, sexuality. Her photographs very, very often explore the idea of sexuality. Um, and oftentimes, sexuality isn't expected. In other words, like, for instance, here, it's John Lennon is someone who um, is respected, and he's purposely posing nude. To, to show the sort of unexpected role that a respected person would play. But also, um, her photographs, she, she did photographs for Rolling Stone and Vanity Fair magazines. And so this is a magazine photograph. This is actually for Rolling Stone. And it's evoking John Lennon's role and Yoko Ono, their roles as music artists, artists in general, but also artists who rebel, artists who don't follow tradition. And thus, they are, they are in a non-traditional photograph. In this case, this is a photograph for Vanity Fair. I think this is a great indicator of Annie Leibovitz's visual style because it is the modern, contemporary, traditional style. It's, it's three-point lighting. So we see that the lighting is very flat and even on Demi Moore's face. This is a, it's a photograph called Moore Demi Moore, and it's for a Vanity Fair cover. So in other words, these are very flat. In this case, it's even been airbrushed. <laughs> you can see the difference. They're glamorized, but that doesn't mean they're not art because they're also very provocative. And they're not standard. So they're often made for magazine covers and magazine articles. But what's interesting is that More Demi Moore actually attracted, this photograph attracted a huge amount of publicity and controversy because you don't often see pregnant women posing nude in a magazine. This isn't really a standard of society. So Leibovitz, just like with the um, John Lennon piece, she's trying to question this. She's trying to question, is there something wrong with this? Should there be something wrong with this? Are we discriminating against women just because you know they're pregnant? Why do we see that as um, unattractive? And she does this more. This is Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> it is a really weird photo. She's nude in a bathtub and that white stuff is milk. So there's this weirdness to it, but she's considering these respected people um, and sort of twisting them around, right? And finally, I wanted to close and say that Leibovitz, she is the most famous photographer in the world. And I want to show that she's still working just as hard. So... If um, you want to learn stuff from someone who's still relevant today, Leibovitz is the one.